I'm Emily Pinnabasi, a clinical instructor in neuropathology at University of Michigan. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the neuropathologic findings associated with some common forms of dementia. In particular, I'll be talking about Alzheimer's disease, Lewy pathology, which encompasses Parkinson's disease and uh, Lewy body dementia, and then finally frontotemporal lobar degeneration or FTLD. All right, so first talking about Alzheimer's disease. So the findings when you examine um, a the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease can often be quite striking, um, even just looking at the exterior surface of the brain. So over on the right, for comparison, I'm showing the brain of a patient that doesn't have any neurodegenerative diseases. And you can see that the folds of the brain, which are called gyri, are very uh, kind of fat and they're snug up against each other. There's not a lot of space in between them. In contrast, if you look over at the left, uh, which it shows the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease, you can see that these folds are much skinnier and there's a lot of space in between them. Uh, you'll also notice that this isn't limited to one portion of the brain, it's kind of all over. So we would term this severe global atrophy and it's a characteristic gross finding in Alzheimer's disease. So once we've examined the exterior of the brain, uh, we then cut sections through the brain to uh, take a look at some of the neuroanatomical structures that are a little bit deeper. And one of these structures uh, is called the hippocampus. This is an area of the brain that's critical for learning and memory, and it's often affected in Alzheimer's disease. So it's this um, kind of spiral shaped structure that's indicated by the arrow. And you'll notice that there's kind of a large space next to it. That's actually the tip of the lateral ventricle. And normally the space is pretty small. Usually the hippocampus should be kind of snug up against the temporal cortex. When it's this large, it's indicative that this structure has atrophied, which is, um, again, kind of a classic thing that you see in Alzheimer's disease. All right, so that's kind of what you see when you look at the exterior of the brain, um, or sorry, when you look at the brain um, grossly. What about when you look under the microscope? So here we have a section of the frontal cortex of the brain. So that's one of the areas of the brain that was really shrunken grossly. And this is a hematoxylin and ESN stain, so our kind of standard stain in pathology that highlights a lot of cellular details. Um, just to orient you, on um, the left is the surface of the brain, and then you're kind of going deeper through the cortical layers um, with the white matter all the way on the right. And you can see um, this like very beautiful architecture with uh, these sort of nice layers of neurons, but there are also some things in this brain that aren't supposed to be there, which become a lot more evident when you start to look a little higher power. So normally the neuropil of the brain is this kind of light pink granular um, appearance. It's very evenly distributed. And what you see uh, with that's kind of pointed out by the arrow is um, what looks like sort of thick pink squiggles and dots. And what this is, is a neuritic plaque, um, which is this um, aggregate in the brain that we now know is mostly composed of um, this protein called beta amyloid. And in fact, when we do a stain for beta amyloid, that is, um, which will like highlight all of the beta amyloid, you can see it highlights these structures really nicely. And so this is that same structure with a beta amyloid immunostain. And now if we zoom out and take a look at the frontal cortex, with um, a beta amyloid stain, you can see that it's just chock full of these neuritic plaques. All right, so that's kind of one of the um, areas of the brain where we saw very prominent gross findings. I remember the other area was the hippocampus, that kind of spiral structure. So here we're now looking at the hippocampus under the microscope, again, using that um, kind of standard pathology stain, the H and E. And you can appreciate um, under the microscope why this looked, you know, so spirally. You have the this um, kind of C-shaped uh, layer of cells called the dentate gyrus, and then you have um, these pyramidal neurons that sort of unspool. 
from willpower, you can maybe appreciate that there's sort of a little bit more white than we would expect. And that is indicative um, that some of these neurons have died, leaving kind of blank spaces. And if we look a little bit closer at some of these neurons, we can see some of these changes. So um, at the top is like a relatively unaffected neuron. And then in the middle, you see a neuron that has these kind of magenta fibrils in it. So this is the classic appearance of a neurofibrillary tangle. And this is kind of the second classic um, pathologic finding in Alzheimer's with like the first being the beta amyloid plaque. So we now know that these neurofibrillary tangles are mostly composed of this protein called tau. And if we do an immunostain for tau, um, again, this is the hippocampus um, with the same spiral structure. Um, you can see that there's just tons and tons of tau pathology throughout. And if we take a closer look to kind of appreciate um, the morphology of these of this tau pathology, you can see that the neurofibrillary tangles kind of look like these flames around the nucleus. Um, you'll also notice that tau accumulates um, in the processes of neurons, and they're called tau neurites. And then interestingly, you also see tau in neuritic plaques. So again, you can see this like these kind of squiggle and dot patterns. All right. So you'll notice, or maybe you've noticed, that um, I called this section Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change instead of just Alzheimer's disease. And the reason for that is that these classic pathologies, the um, amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles, also are present in the brains of people who are aging normally without um, symptoms of uh, dementia. However, the more of these pathologies you have, the higher likelihood that um, they'll be associated with a clinical syndrome of dementia. And so the way that we kind of handle this as pathologists is that we stage each of these pathologies. Um, so we give each brain a stage for beta amyloid, a stage for the neurofibrillary tangles, and then finally um, a third score, a C-score, that is just the density of um, amyloid plaques. And then we kind of integrate these scores together to say this either isn't Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change, or there's a low, intermediate, or high likelihood that this degree of pathology would be associated with the clinical syndrome of dementia. All right, so this first part of the scoring is the FAL phase, and it's basically where is the beta amyloid present in the brain? So we now know that amyloid pathology follows this kind of stereotyped uh, progression where it starts in the cortex and then progresses into the deep gray structures and then finally down in the brainstem and um, it finally involves uh, the cerebellum. And so what we do as pathologists is we take standard sections in some of these brain areas and then we do immunostains for beta amyloid. And we simply score like, is this, is beta amyloid pres uh, pathology present or absent? And based on the brain areas where we see beta amyloid pathology, we assign a phase. All right, next we stage the tau pathology. So tau pathology, um, like beta amyloid pathology, follows this kind of stereotyped progression where it kind of begins in the entorhinal cortex um, and then progresses to involve um, these different areas of the hippocampus um, usually sparing the subiculum. And then the kind of last affected areas are um, the, the cortex. And simply by looking at this one section, the hippocampus, um, it basically tells you um, kind of all you need to know about the distribution of tau within the rest of the brain. Uh, that's simplifying a little bit, but this is, this is the basic staging um, schema. And here's an example again. So here's the hippocampus with the tau immunostain. And you can see here that we have tau pathology kind of throughout the hippocampus um, and then all the way into the temporal isocortex. So we're within the cortical stages. All right, and finally, the last component to scoring um, the degree of Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change is looking at the density of amyloid plaques. And here it's just, um, basically counting how many plaques you have in a single field. And this is an example of kind of the highest density of plaques that you get, the C3. 
All right, and then finally, you integrate these stores, as I mentioned, to um, determine the likelihood that this degree of neuropathologic change would be associated with dementia. All right, and then we finally issue a diagnosis um, in which we say, you know, it's Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change. We list again the likelihood, and then we'll list out the three um, components that we score. All right, so now Louis pathology. So as I mentioned earlier, this encompasses Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. And notably, these diseases are clinically um, distinguished by kind of the onset of motor symptoms, the temporal onset of motor symptoms um, in comparison to cognitive symptoms. As neuropathologists, we actually cannot distinguish between these. So um, what we do is we can evaluate um, all Lewy pathology and then kind of give it a stage. So in terms of the gross findings that are associated with Lewy disease, so there can be atrophy like we saw with Alzheimer's disease, but also the um, brain volume can be sometimes relatively unaffected. But one very characteristic feature of Lewy disease is um, shown below. So over on the right, this is um, a section through the brainstem in an unaffected patient where you can appreciate kind of the normal neuroanatomy. So um, at the bottom of the image is the cerebellum. The top of the image is the midbrain. Um, I always think this kind of looks like a Mickey Mouse. So it's got the two ears. Those are the cerebral peduncles. It's got the mouth. That's the cerebral aqueduct through which CSF flows. And then there are these kind of two black lines. That's the substantia nigra. Now, if we look over on the left, this is um, a cut through uh, the midbrain at the same level. And you can see that you no longer see this black line. And the reason for that is that the neurons that make up um, this pigmented structure um, are actually preferentially affected uh, in Lewy body disease. All right, so now taking a look under the scope, this is that same um, the same neuroanatomical structure. So over here on the left is like the Mickey Mouse ear. Um, near the bottom is the cerebral aqueduct, so the Mickey Mouse mouth. And then um, kind of going um, across the screen is the substantia nigra. And if we go a little bit higher power, you can appreciate um, that there's pigment in there. So that's why, you know, grossly it appears like a black or brown line. Um, and with um, like, after looking at a lot of cases, um, you can appreciate that there really aren't as many pigmented neurons here as there ought to be. And once we take um, a closer look, you can see that inside these pigmented neurons, you have these kind of bright pink structures. You can also appreciate that there's some areas where you see pigment that isn't in a neuron. And this is actually in macrophages and it's uh, indicating that these neurons have died. Um, over here on the right are some kind of close-up images where you can see these really pretty inclusions where you have, um, they're kind of perfectly round and they have this light pink outer shell and then this dense dark pink core. So this is the Lewy body. And we now know that these Lewy bodies are composed uh, predominantly of alpha synuclein. And so you can perform uh, a synuclein immunostain to kind of highlight them. And you'll notice that you start to see um, that synuclein has accumulated in other areas as well. So you see that it's accumulated in the processes of neurons forming these Lewy neurites. And you also see kind of um, these like vague amorphous blobs of synuclein, um, which is kind of what you get before it compacts down into a Lewy body. All right, and then if you zoom out, you can see that um, in the substantia nigra, there's just tons and tons of synuclein pathology. All right, so as I mentioned, um, neuropathologically, we cannot distinguish between Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease. Um, but again, like tau and like beta amyloid, Lewy pathology follows this kind of stereotyped progression through the brain. So it begins in the um, dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, progresses through these pigmented structures, um, the locus ceruleus in the pons, and then the substantia nigra in the midbrain, which is what I, what I showed you. Um, and then it kind of escapes the brainstem 
into and uh, progresses into the limbic system, in particular the anterior cingulate and the hippocampus. And then finally, um, in the last stage, um, it starts to involve the neocortex. And so again, what we do as pathologists is take standard sections in these brain regions, stain for synuclein, and then um, kind of evaluate um, whether Lewy pathology is present, is present, and if so, um, the extent of it. All right, and here is um, an HME of part of the limbic system, the anterior cingulate. Over here on the left, you can see this large white matter tract that's um, the anterior commissure. And then um, looking at the anterior cingulate, I've shown a zoom in view of a neuron um, with another Lewy body. And if you do a an, uh, synuclein immunostain, you can see that there's just tons and tons of uh, um, Lewy bodies in here. All right. Um, and so as I mentioned before, we um, perform these stains on each of these brain areas and then come up with an integrated diagnosis. So if we had Lewy pathology, um, for example, in cortical sections, we would call Lewy pathology, Lewy pathology diffuse neocortical. All right, so finally, moving on to our last neurodegenerative disease, FTLD. Um, so frontotemporal lobar degeneration is actually associated with, um, or is actually subcategorized um, into two broad categories pathologically, um, those associated with tau pathology and those associated with TDP43 pathology. And today I'm only gonna be talking about um, the findings that we see with FTLD tau, which is also called fixed disease. All right, so these brains have a very characteristic gross appearance. So um, if you look, you'll notice that when you look kind of in the back of the brain, so in the occipital lobe, um, these folds are pretty thick and they're kind of right up against each other. However, if you look at the front of the brain, you'll notice that these folds are just tiny and there's tons and tons of space in between them. And you'll also notice that um, in the temporal lobe, so like the areas with these two arrows. Uh, and so this is very characteristic and actually um, is, is why this disease is named frontotemporal lobar degeneration because of this um, very striking atrophy that's really limited to those brain regions. All right, and then when we take cross sections of the brain, another neuroanatomical landmark that is uh, pretty uh, severely affected is the hippocampus, as we saw with Alzheimer's disease. And here again, we see this like spiral structure and notice that this space next to it is absolutely huge. All right, so what do we see under the microscope with this disease? So here is um, again, an H and E of uh, the frontal cortex. So one of those areas that was really shrunken and at low power, you can see that there's tons and tons of white space. And if you look a little bit closer, you can see, um, you can possibly um, kind of appreciate that there are a lot of like kind of pink spidery like things. And so these are reactive astrocytes. Um, they're like kind of the support cells of the brain that are reacting to the fact that a lot of neurons have died. And you can also, appreciate once you go into high power that um, within the neurons there are these inclusions that look kind of round. And we now know that um, the major protein component of these aggregates, at least in FTLD tau, is like, as you can guess from the name, tau. And so this is a tau immunostain of the same brain region, and you can see all of these round inclusions, just tons and tons of them. And then if you look at this other area of the brain, the hippocampus, um, again, the, the second area of the brain that looks um, grossly very atrophic, you can see on H and E, tons and tons of these round inclusions in the dentate gyrus. And if we do a tau immunostain, um, it highlights all of these inclusions. All right, and so for STLD, there's actually no um, staging involved in this. So we simply give a diagnosis, FTLD tau, um, also known as fixed disease. All right, so I've gone over the neuropathologic findings associated with some of these common neuro neurodegenerative diseases.
Alzheimer's disease, Lewy pathology, and FTLD tau.